Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name, as most of you know by now, is Steve Tinney. hasn't changed. And I am the director, the deputy, I'm not getting ahead of myself, I'm the deputy director of the Penn Museum. Unbridled ambition is a terrible thing. Um, many thanks to all of you for coming out to tonight's installment of our annual Great Lectures. This year, of course, our theme is Great Stuff, something we have a lot of in the museum. And we're looking at a whole range of aspects of the topic, including, for example, in the next lecture, looking after our stuff. Uh, that lecture is entitled, The Stuff You Do Not See, Conservation for a Renovated Museum. It will be presented on December the 5th by our head conservator, Lynn Grant. It's been an excellent thing to hear. As usual, after the lecture, there'll be time for questions, which will be moderated by our speaker. There'll be a microphone going the round so everyone can hear the questions as well as the answers. So to our speaker, Dr. Brian I. Daniels, Director of Research and Programs in the Penn Cultural Heritage Center here in the Penn Museum. Besides his role in the Cultural Heritage Center, Brian is also Adjunct Assistant Professor in the University of Pennsylvania Anthropology Graduate Group, Visiting Professor in the Sustainable Cultural Heritage Graduate Program at the American University of Rome, and Research Associate at the Smithsonian Museum Institution. His research centers around three concerns. One, conflict, cultural loss, and human rights violations. Two, community-based approaches to cultural heritage preservation. And three, indigenous rights and recognition. So he's an expert in things that we haven't really had people talk to us about before in these great series. Currently, Brian leads the National Science Foundation supported Conflict Culture Research Network a group of scholars at 15 international universities and research organizations focused on the study of, international cult of, uh, sorry, of intentional cultural destruction. He has received the Society for American Archaeology's Presidential Recognition Award for his efforts to protect Syrian and Iraqi cultural heritage, and the Lynn Raya Award in Tribal Community Development from the Society for the Preservation of American Indian Culture for his work with the Shasta Indian Communities of Northern California. He previously served as the manager of the National Endowment for the Humanities Regional Center Initiative at San Francisco State University, where he worked on strategies for public engagement and digital humanities. Here at the museum, Brian was also co-curator of the exhibition Cultures in the Crossfire, which has been a huge success, and I thank him and all the other curators for that. It's a really trailblazing blend of ancient objects and interpretation, modern cultural heritage protection issues, and contemporary art. Uh, that exhibition is closing November 25th, a couple weeks' time. So if you haven't seen it, I strongly recommend that you try to do so in the next few weeks. Knowing his work as I do, I can attest that Brian is the perfect guide to take us through his particular kind of stuff. In his presentation, Protecting Stuff Today, Cultural Heritage Sites, and the Penn Museum. So please join me in welcoming him now. Brian. Thank you, Steve, for that generous introduction. It is very good to be with you today to talk about protecting stuff what we do here at the Penn Museum to deal with the different kinds of tragedies that befall cultural heritage, both in our own country and internationally. So I want to begin with this photograph, an event that some of you in the audience will likely be familiar with, the loss of the National Museum in Brazil, in Rio de Janeiro, just at the beginning of September due to an electrical fault and fire. And many of you will probably have read in international media that the collections were near a total loss, of mostly natural history collections, but also incredible archaeological material, ethnographic material, and the linguistic collections for many of Brazil's indigenous communities. And this particular cultural loss has become something of a touchstone right now among the international community that deals with disaster risk management and cultural heritage emergencies as we think through about what to do about protecting our stuff. And so this is where we're going to explore tonight. We're going to begin here, and we're going to talk about some of the things that we do to address 
these kinds of pressing issues, which are sadly becoming more and more frequent. But to do that, I need to walk you through a bit of my own preservation story. As you heard me introduced, I was working on a National Endowment for the Humanities Initiative project in 2001 when the event that you see on the screen happened in Bamiyan, Afghanistan. And one of the things that I remember so vividly about that particular moment was sitting at my desk and receiving an email in the, in the days leading up to the destruction of the sculptures here. And the, it was an all-staff email to the National Endowment for the Humanities, all staff and extended staff, asking, what can we do? Well, is there anything we can do? Any ideas? And the answer to that at the time was, of course, no. Now, when that initiative ended, I decided that it would be a very good time to go back to graduate school and get a PhD in the winter of 2002. And of course, we all know what happened in the spring of 2003, the looting and destruction of the Iraq National Museum. And one of the things that I found myself in some ways impressed into here at the museum was dealing with that. How do you deal with the destruction of a museum? How do you recover the artifacts that were lost? And um, this museum ran, and, and I helped administer, a nine-year project with the US Department of State to train law enforcement how to recognize and repatriate objects stolen from the Iraq National Museum back to their rightful home. But there have been other events here at Timbuktu, the destruction of the Sufi shrines and the burning of the libraries that resulted in so much cultural destruction at this incredibly important place that has been a center of learning and academic scholarship for hundreds of years. And then finally, we arrive here to the present conflict in, in, in Syria and Iraq, the destruction of Palmyra. This photograph made the cover of the New York Times. And so in, in many ways, I share this because my own career as a scholar has been bookended for the past 18 years by events of cultural destruction. And it's been formative to how I think and how I respond to and how I encourage others in the museum field now that I teach here to think about cultural heritage destruction and what the kinds of responses are. And so what we're going to do tonight is we're going to walk through three major issues about protecting stuff. How we respond to archeological site looting. How we train emergency responders and cultural heritage professionals to deal with disasters. And finally, how we both identify and build community-based responses that we have seen time and time again to be the most effective in protecting stuff. So we'll begin here. And so this is an image that may be, again, familiar to many of you in the audience. In the mid-90s, there was great concern about the looting of archeological material from, in particular, Greece, Italy, and Turkey. And so this is a particularly famous sculpture, um, the uh, Griffins attacking a fawn. And this was found, uh, this was uh, displayed at, at the Getty. And the man you see next to it is named Giacomo de' Medici. And Giacomo de' Medici was the intermediary dealer that coordinated a group of looters. And the Griffins attacking a fawn were initially looted from Italy. And you can see the photograph of them in the back of the Volvo right after they were dug up. Medici insisted that Polaroid photographs be taken by all of his looters of material as it was looted. Now, this was a great asset to law enforcement <laughs> when, the, uh, when, the, when the looting network was finally unraveled and Mr. Medici was convicted in it by Italian law. But most of our attention about archaeological site looting, and in some ways this is a good news story, has been devoted to the Greco-Roman world and the outstanding work of the Italian Carbonieri and Greek authorities and Turkish authorities in trying to stem the looting in those sites. And then we came to the current conflict in the Middle East. And what you're looking at here 
is Dura Europis prior to 2013. Now, Dura Europis, many of you are probably aware, is a very famous archaeological site, famous for its multi-religious character, famous because one of the oldest depictions of Jesus Christ is found at the site, famous, too, because the oldest known synagogue in the ancient world is also from this particular site. And it is also, unfortunately, my candidate for the most looted archaeological site in the world. And this particular photograph comes from April of 2014. And those red circles that you see in the center here are cars of looters as they came into this site. And all of these pits are, are looters' holes. We think looking principally for coins. Um, this, this particular site is known for the kind of coinage it had produced from the properly excavated areas that you see here. And coins are very easy to sell. They're easy to smuggle. They're sold not necessarily even on eBay, but oftentimes from person to person on other electronic uh, forms of social media, um, like Facebook, for instance. And so the scale here is really striking. The pink that you see is the area inside the walls that has been looted. The yellow is the area outside. There are so many looters pits here that analysts with the American Association for the Advancement of Science who worked on this with us could not identify exactly how many holes there were. There were holes upon holes. And sadly, this is the kind of looting that we're seeing in Syria and parts of Iraq. Now, this particular site came under ISIS control in midsummer 2014, but the looting here probably was not directly ISIS related. It was done in the context of the political instability that happened to be going on in the space. This, however, was ISIS linked. The looting at Tel Harari, known as Mari, famous for its tablet collections. You can see all these red circles, which are all news looters pits to 2014 and 2015. You can see looting going on here squarely in the center of the main part of the site. Now, it's not just conflict-affected countries that are affected by looting. Here, we're at Bab al in Jordan, which is a well-known and well-studied necropolis by my colleague Morag Kersel and her team at DePaul University. And this particular site is known for its old kind of pottery that sells well in the old city of Jerusalem. And what happens when you loot a necropolis? Well, looters leave behind broken pots. They leave behind non-sellable material, and they leave behind human remains of the people who were buried there some 4,000 or more years ago. And the, the pots that are found here may sell anywhere between $100 and $500 a piece, depending upon their size and quality. But the loss that we see here to the archaeological record is intense. It's significant. And once the context of an object is disturbed, much as you see here in this kind of moonscape of, of, uh, of a site, archaeologists have a very difficult time recovering and understanding that site then, because we've lost the stratigraphy. We've lost the association of what objects are found with each other. And it becomes challenging for us to interpret or to understand what to do with these sites. So what do we do about looting? How do we protect stuff in this particular context? Well, you're, we happen to be at the Penn Museum. And the Penn Museum is one of the museums in this country that has a well-known and highly regarded reputation for the legality that it treats its collections, the legality of obtaining material. The vast majority of material in this institution has provenance. It has a fine spot. We know where it came out of the earth because archaeologists worked on it. They excavated. They made firm records which sit in our archives here. Or in other institutions that we partnered with to gather this information. And the international law that governs illicit site looting 
is called the 1970 UNESCO Convention for the Protection of Cultural Property. But something very special happened at this particular museum back in 1970. This curatorial staff and the direct, then director made a decision that this museum would not acquire any looted archaeological material. Full stop. And since 1970, this has been the lodestar of this institution. It's called the Pennsylvania Declaration. And the Pennsylvania De Declaration ultimately influenced the museum ethics of really every global institution. This was the first museum to do this in the modern era. It was the first museum to say that it would not acquire stolen property. And I realize that sounds very basic, but this was a revolutionary idea in 1970. And this museum was intensely unpopular for taking that stance and was ridiculed greatly in professional publications of the day. But ultimately, Harvard University followed suit in 1971. And in 1973, the Smithsonian Institution also endorsed the Pennsylvania Declaration. And in many ways, this museum is not only still guided by the Pennsylvania Declaration, because it still is firmly part of our curatorial policy and practices here, but it has influenced this museum's status and ability to be able to work with people around the globe because other countries know we're not here to steal their cultural heritage. We're not going to acquire it if it was offered. And that is a very powerful animating idea and gives this institution an enormous amount of credibility that is really very difficult to convey to people in Philadelphia for whom this sounds like an immediately reasonable idea. But it is one of this museum's strongest aspects internationally and globally. Now, how else do we stop looting? How do we protect the stuff? Well, the answer is an advocacy, because we need laws that actually prevent it. And I'll explain more about that in a moment. But the only way to stop looting, really, is to deny a market for the looted material. And to deny a market of looted material, special laws must be passed in the United States in order to actually make sure that illicitly looted cultural material does not come into our own borders available for sale. And that requires special action by Congress. And Senator Casey from Pennsylvania has been one of the most active members of Congress on this particular issue, certainly the most active member in the Senate and takes very seriously the problem of cultural heritage looting and has been a partner with this institution on working on legislation to help protect cultural property. And so what laws do we actually have on the books that helped protect cultural property? Well, we have the Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act of 1983. That's our law that implements the 1970 UNESCO Convention. But it doesn't work unless a country asks for it to work. That's one of the trips of it. And so we don't have that many memoranda of understanding with other countries to restrict the import of illicitly looted cultural property. And the, the law, that law doesn't work particularly well in conflict events either. So Congress passed the Emergency Protection for Iraqi Cultural Antiquities Act in 2004 which places an, a permanent restriction on the importation of looted Iraqi material into this country. Congress, in 2005, attempted to pass such legislation for Afghanistan, but it failed, in large measure from lobbying by the coin collecting community. And so to this day, for most classes of, Af of Afghan cultural heritage, there is no um, import restriction on their looted material in the United States, and it can be sold freely and legally. In 2016, Congress, thanks to the leadership of, of uh, Senator Casey, but also Representative Engel of New York and the retiring Representative Ed Royce of California, um, enacted the Protect and Preserve International Cultural Property Act, which placed import restrictions on material looted from Syria. Again, these are very basic kinds of ideas. But it's absolutely necessary to work and advocate for these laws. And I encourage everyone here 
If this is something that you take seriously, write your congressman, write your senator. Thank our Philadelphia senator for being so, so involved in tackling this important issue. How else do we deal with protecting stuff? How else do we deal with looted material? Well, the answer is SOS. And that doesn't mean save our stuff. It actually is an acronym that we use in the field to describe three things. Situation analysis, on-site damage and risk assessment, and stabilization and security, SOS. And this is a method for dealing with damaged uh, material, either by earthquake or by conflict, but it is the guiding principle that we use in emergency response Response and in training people to address cultural heritage damage and destruction. And it was developed by ECROM. Now, ECROM is an acronym that doesn't actually make sense. It actually stands for the International Center for the Study of the Preservation and Restoration of Cultural Property. How about that mouthful? <laughs> Otherwise known as the International Conservation Center of Rome. And ECROM has long been working on this issue. It was an organization created not long after the Second World War, specifically to train and to fund projects to restore war-torn Europe. And now ECROM continues that tradition with assistance from the Prince Klaus Fund for Cultural Development and further assistance from the Smithsonian Institution to develop training and to teach how to do this kind of emergency response because we see the need at such scale in places like Iraq and Syria. So how does SOS work? Well, the three stages here are situation analysis, on-site damage and risk assessment, and security and stabilization before we ever get to the stage of early recovery. And early recovery sounds very flashy. It's when you get to rebuild things. It's when you start to be able to begin to put lives back together and to go on. But there are certain kinds of moments, things that we need to do before that. And what I want to do is I want to talk about how we do training in SOS. And I'm going to give you some examples of this, but I want to give you the flavor a little bit of what I cover when I teach this methodology for ECROM or here at the University of Pennsylvania. With situation analysis, what we're really talking about is, what's the context you're working in? Is there somebody going to shoot at you? Is something about to collapse? Do you have permission? What steps do you need to take to be able to proceed? Who are the stakeholders? What communities care about this particular kind of cultural heritage? Then, once we've ascertained this kind of very basic information, we move on to on-site damage and risk assessment. And that involves looking at the cultural site. It means formulating a plan. It means figuring out what the next steps are, what the funding line is. And then we move on to security and stabilization. And a lot of the photographs that you'll see, both from me, but in international media are at that security and stabilization stage. It involves taking specific kinds of measures to keep a site safe, to keep the heritage professionals who work there safe, until such time as wonderful conservators like Lynn Grant, who you will hear from in the next lecture series, can work and do their, do their wonders in doing a full on to do full-on conservation. In many ways, SOS is about a momentary band-aid to prevent things from getting immeasurably worse. And oftentimes, it's done in the most adverse and difficult conditions to where we don't have ideal material. We don't have ideal conditions. We don't know what may happen to the site next week or next month or next year even, especially in the case of conflict. We don't know when the conservators will be able to come. And so in many ways, this is about trying to keep a space safe, almost like putting a splint on an arm when it's broken, so that way it can heal. And that way, professionals can come in to do their good work. 
So I have been privileged over the past several years to be one of the trainers at ECROM for the first Aid to Culture course. And what, you're, what I'm going to show you is some of the culminating photographs of, of the course. At the end, there is an exercise, an SOS exercise, that requires the students to do a situation analysis, to do on-site damage and risk assessment, and then finally to undertake stabilization and security measures in a very compressed amount of time. So what you're looking at here is the scenario. The scenario is that our trainees had two hours to be able to deal with an oncoming forest fire that threatened to obliterate a museum in its path. And in those two hours, they had to figure out how to do an evacuation of already damaged material from early fire and to actually deal with oncoming fire. And so I show this because these are intense exercises. Oftentimes, the students who come here come from countries experiencing conflict or dramatic earthquake damage or fire or flood damage from other kinds of anthropogenic disasters. Places like Nepal, places like India. And so we want to give a real sense of the seriousness that a disaster conveys. I also teach this at Penn. And I teach it at Penn not necessarily because that I expect our students at this university will themselves ever need to do this, but I teach it because I want to convey to our students the challenges that heritage professionals in other countries face when doing this kind of work. And so I'll walk you through the scenario that I teach upstairs in our classrooms at this museum. <coughs> So the scenario is this. Unfortunately, there has been a bomb blast in a, in a glass gallery. The building has been stabilized by engineers for one hour. You must evacuate the collection. How are you going to do it? And so we provide basic materials for our students to use such that they might, be, they might have in any kind of office environment or any kind of museum environment. And I always throw in a few surprises. So this is my surprise named Jake Archer, Special Agent Jake Archer. <coughs> Jake Archer is a great name for an FBI agent, isn't it? <laughs> Only that's his real name. And so he joined the students. Now, Special Agent Jake Archer in real life is a member of the FBI art crime team for, Northeast, for the Northeastern United States and one of the lead bomb analysis and recovery technicians for the FBI. And so it was under his watchful eye that our students engaged in this exercise to figure out how to properly record, pack, grid, remove the damaged cultural material, and then to sort and ensure that all of the material was properly recovered in that very compressed length of time. And you can see here the kind, the, the, you can see here the outcome. The, the students did very well here, I have to say, in, a, in their very compressed amount of time because the truth is we cut the power to the room after 50 minutes because you never really know how stable your hour rating might actually be. <laughs> and then Special Agent Archer gave his opinion of how the students actually did. Did they meet FBI standard? Did they do a good job? So this was a rather intense moment for our students. I'm told they liked it very much, but I admit they were nervous. And the reason is that there is a seriousness to this. This was a training exercise for the First Day for Culture program that we supported in Iraq. At the, Erbil, at the, uh, the Iraqi Institute for the Conservation of Antiquities and Heritage in Erbil in 2015, at the moment that ISIS was busy occupying Mosul. At the moment when the risk of ISIS breakout beyond Mosul was significant. And this particular exercise brought together under my, the auspices of my colleagues at the Smithsonian and at the Iraqi Institute itself, a group of heritage professionals from around the country, Iraqi, Kurd, Christian, Sunni, and Shia, 
to talk about how you protect cultural heritage and what you can do in these kinds of situations. And what you're looking at here is the outcome of their final exercise. Well, one of two final exercises, I should say. And they were given the task of how you would move a tablet, like we have upstairs in the Middle Eastern galleries, from an ISIS-controlled territory, such that ISIS would not search for it, identify it, and remove it. And you're looking, and they could only use the material in their dorm room. And you're looking at all of their outcomes about how they packed it. And you can see there's some very creative wrappings here. Some are in lunch boxes. Some are in um, personal toiletry kits. There's, there's some here in a videotape box. But the one that everyone agreed would work is that there, one of the tablets was packed in a tampon box. That was going to do it. We did a similar training exercise for Syrians in southern Turkey in June of 2014. And here are, the, here are a group of uh, heritage professionals from the Idlib area, who I'll be talking about more in a moment, carefully undergoing their exercise, evacuating a museum that needed to be evacuated um, that you see in the background, but carefully recording, wrapping, and labeling all of the different material in order to move it, move it to safety. So I want to talk a little bit more now about protecting the stuff in Syria and Iraq specifically because it is so much on everyone's mind right now. And because the kind of fact training, the first aid for culture training I showed you in, for Syrians and for Iraqis in Erbil and in southern Turkey, I want to talk to you about how this museum got involved in that project and in that work, much of which you can also see in the Cultures in the Crossfire Gallery upstairs. But what I want to talk to you about tonight is how and why we started. In 2013, Dr. Salam al-Kuntar, um, here at the Penn Museum upstairs, gave a lunchtime talk about the conflict in Syria. She herself was the deputy director of the Directorate General of Antiquities and Museums in Syria. And she had fled from Syria in 2012 in fear of her life. She was targeted for arrest, and she felt no longer safe with very good reason. And through a variety of, for a variety of reasons, she came to here at this university, and this university took her on as a refugee scholar. And so she gave this talk to a packed room, not altogether different from this one. And afterwards, she came up to me in January. It was January of 2013. And she said, what are you going to do about Syria? Now, that's a damning question, right? I mean, one of the greatest challenges I think I've, and I hope that I've conveyed to you so far is that this is hard. And this museum occupies a very important place internationally in the kind of ethics it has a reputation of upholding and in the kind of commitments that it makes to protecting cultural heritage around the world. And it seemed to me at the time, in trying to think about how to respond to this question, that it was really hard to look ourselves in the mirror and say that we behave as an ethical organization and not confront the Syrian crisis and the destruction of heritage there head on. And so that night, I called my colleague Corinne Widener at the Smithsonian and I said, I think we need to have a talk. And we brought together that April essentially all of the groups that had worked on the emergency response to Iraq in 2003 and 4, to meet, to talk, and to figure out a plan of what to do in Syria. That resulted in the Safeguarding the Heritage of Syria and Iraq project, a, a multinational group of different organizations, what you might call a coalition of the willing, who all said, yes, we're going to try. We're not sure how we're going to do this, but we're going to make our best effort 
to engage with heritage professionals who have been adversely affected in this crisis. And we're going to do our level best to protect cultural heritage in this conflict zone. Most major initiatives globally that have protected cultural heritage in conflict have been originated and organized by a military force, like the Allies during the Second World War and the, fab and the fabled Monuments, Fine Arts, and Archives officers in that George Clooney movie you might have seen. <laughs> this wasn't going to be like that in any kind of way. We knew that, that we were museums and nonprofits, and we were going to have to find a different way. And so what we did was we organized a meeting in southern Turkey to be able to offer to our affected colleagues who were outside of areas controlled by the Assad regime education about first aid for culture training. And this was at their request to talk about how you do evacuation, to talk about SOS, to talk about everything that you heard me describe in these kinds of conflict zones in practice that was, for them, real life. And so over several days, we had the training activity. We bought supplies for them to take back into Syria. And I think most crucially, we had a discussion about priorities, about what could feasibly be done. And it's this conversation that led the Shosi project to expand and to do a great deal more and to really think about what a more fulsome response could be in the midst of conflict. One of its first major successes was the protection at the Mara Mosaic Museum, which is in the ancient cities of, near the ancient cities of northern Syria World Heritage Site, and a famous collection of late antique and early Byzantine period mosaics. Now, Mara happens to be at an important strategic crossroads in the conflict. The museum itself had already been damaged. So the question was, how do you protect its mosaic collection? The mosaics were immovable. In 1970s curatorial style, they had been concreted to the walls. So what we came up with, um, after consulting mosaic curators across the country, was a strategy that would involve putting glue down on the mosaics and then using flaspum polyurethane fabric or cotton sheeting and pasting that onto the mosaic. So that way, if the building was bombed, at least the tessera would stick to the cloth. We then um, proposed a sandbagging technique. It just wasn't random sandbags thrown on a wall. But during the Second World War, for those of you who have visited Da Vinci's Last Supper in Milan, you'll know or may remember that that building was destroyed by bombing, except for the walls with the paintings on them, one of which being da Vinci's, um, da Vinci's Last Supper, because of a very specific sandbagging technique that had been used there. We borrowed that technique here and proposed and informed our Syrian colleagues about it. And ultimately, this museum has now sustained three direct bombings. The building itself is damaged, quite likely beyond repair. But the mosaic collection survives, in large measure because of this technique, and because of, because of the sandbagging technique, and because of the glue and the fabric on the mosaic tessera. The site of Ebla is also famed for its cuneiform tablet collection. And as such, it was a target of looters early on looking for other cuneiform tablets or cylinder seals, which are portable and valuable for the illicit trade. So again, the group of, uh, the group of heritage professionals we were working with in Syria documented all of the different looters' pits on the ground, one of which you see here and also looked for the looters' holes, where looters had tunneled underneath the foundations, underneath the different buildings, to look for this material in order to prop them up 
again, with very, very basic concrete blocks in order to prevent the overall collapse of the buildings and the loss of the archaeological site itself. These are very simple measures, but they're what needs to be done. At the Ferkia mosaic, another famous in situ mosaic from the ancient cities of northern, uh, northern Syria World Heritage Site, this uh, mosaic in a, uh, an acropolis in a burial area was exposed partially by looters, and this team reburied it and sealed it off after, doing, after fully documenting it in order to discourage its theft. And one of the things that we began thinking about more and more about this initiative as it went on is how we address living traditions that are now at risk because of the refugee crisis, because the elderly generation that holds the traditional knowledge is oftentimes displaced, or unfortunately because of displacement has died prematurely. How do you protect that kind of knowledge? And so we partnered with educational NGOs that were offering schools inside these archaeological sites to work with them to provide curricula for the children to learn about the heritage sites themselves, to learn a basic conservation, to learn kind of what to do and not to do with different archaeological materials, which you see the little girl here holding up the Arabic word for dome and the English word for dome. One of the strategies we used was to couple English language training with cultural heritage because there was and is an English language training program built into already into the educational programming. We also, in the, we also began working to help protect traditions like straw weaving, which has regional variation across Syria, but is a tradition only practiced by a few elderly women to create a master and apprentice training program. So that way this tradition could be passed on to younger women and to children, thereby keeping this living tradition alive. Much of this work has been done by the Idlib Antiquity Center, the entity that has come into being from the people who we trained in southern Turkey back in 2014. They've become, over time, more organized. They have their own offices. They have worked with us to enhance their own training capacities and abilities and reach. And they've lately launched the international campaign Save the Antiquities of Idlib, hand in hand to protect it, the logo of which you see here. Their work has been extraordinary and has advanced so much beyond the early photographs that I showed you. Here, for instance, this section of the wall had been removed for building material, threatening the entire building's collapse. The team at the Idlib Antiquity Center created false masonry in order to actually replace it and provide overall building stabilization, again, to prevent the building's imminent collapse. They've also worked at the Idlib Museum, the site where the Ebla tablets are held. Now, much of this collection has been stolen by Al-Qaeda-linked terror groups. But the Idlib Antiquity Center now is working at the museum to document the losses, to document what tablets survive. And they've now been digitally recorded and have been moved to much more safe storage. But you can see here the uniforms and the workflow processes that they've created make them unquestionably the world's experts in protecting cultural heritage during conflict. I think it's a testament to this museum that we're able to support them in this kind of work. There is, of course, still tragedy that exists in cultural heritage Perhaps the best known tragedy in recent years beyond the Brazil National Museum 
was the destruction by ISIS of the Mosul Museum, which featured in its first cultural heritage-related propaganda video. ISIS strapped explosives to one of the Lamassu in the museum and several other important sculptural reliefs and detonated it. That means that the material there remains. It means there is a very large hole in the floor. It means that the challenge is in trying to figure out how to piece this museum back together. I'm hopeful, though. I recently returned from Erbil, Iraq, where we had a meeting with the director of the Mosul Museum, with the head of the State Board of Antiquities of Heritage in Iraq for the Nineveh province and the head of the Iraqi Institute specifically to talk about how to undertake this work. It will be funded by a new foundation based in Switzerland designed specifically to help rebuild destroyed cultural heritage. And I think this will happen. And I'm very happy and pleased to have been asked to advise in, in the reconstruction of this museum. But it will happen because there's goodwill. Goodwill be among institutions who are willing to lend a helping hand. And organizations like this museum who are willing to be that helping hand. Challenges remain. There are museums and universities throughout the world that are at risk from future conflict and other kinds of disasters. And the map you see here just gives you a sense of some of the organizations that the Penn Cultural Heritage Center here at the museum is now involved with and talking to, trying to assess what those risks are. But again, there is much to be hopeful about because even when the destruction seems total and overwhelming, Groups like the Idlib Antiquity Center, with a modicum of support from people like us, can do amazing things and have small, wonderful successes, even in the midst of the most brutal conflict. Thank you for listening tonight, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. So there will be a microphone going around for, for questions. Uh, the uh, laws you mentioned early on were focused on just one or two countries. Uh, why such a narrow focus, and how would you know when you found a, a somebody trying to sell something whether it actually came from that country? So both are very good questions. So why such a narrow focus in the legislation? Well, the short answer to that is that was what was politically feasible at the time. Congress thus far has adopted a country-by-country -country approach to the protection of cultural heritage. I eagerly await the day when it will be politically feasible to, uh, to have a more comprehensive approach to cultural heritage protection. And I'm actually quite confident that that day is nearing, and it may be nearing as soon as the new Congress this January. How do we know what kinds of objects come from what country? That's a, that's a trickier question um, in the sense that we have experts here at the Penn Museum and other institutions that in many ways can recognize objects on the basis of uh, uh, different styles of the objects, different chemical compositions of the objects, and be able to pinpoint their country of origin that way. But one of the amazing things about having a curatorial staff at a museum such as this one is the amazing amount of expertise that they have in being able to discern these very, very fine-grained distinctions. And in many ways, I, I often joke that they look to me for the law, and I look to them for that kind of expertise. Other questions? Sir. So the question really is about climate change and damage to archaeological sites, sea level rise. I would also add to that storms. 
Um, one of the saddest examples I've seen of climate change damage to archaeological sites is actually coming from, um, from the Sudan. At pyramid sites there were increased wind speed um, brought, brought about by more intense storms just in the past decade alone has done more damage to those pyramids than in the past two centuries of recording. The answer is that there's a number of archaeologists, specifically on sea level rise, who are trying to do emergency documentation and salvage at sites that are, looking, that are, that are under threat from being submerged. Um, the National Museum of the American Indian, for instance, just um, had one of their curators do an emergency excavation in Puerto Rico at a major uh, site that was at risk for loss there. The strategy that we've had thus far in the international community is one of salvage um, in the face of anthropogenic climate change. And it remains to be seen if there are other kinds of strategies that can be used as well. But right now, it's unfortunately just one of mitigation. Other questions? Did you, did I hear you correctly that coin collector lobbies kept something from passing in Congress? Because that's fascinating to me, that we have a coin collector lobby that's wrong. There is a particularly strong coin collector lobby. <laughs> yes. So, you know, I'm very much aware of like, how vital it is to protect cultural heritage, especially in the face of conflict and natural disaster. How do we reconcile the perception of being paternalistic, where, you know, where Western resources and Western ideology sort of asserting um, knowledge and, and basically asserting ourselves in cultures that aren't necessarily our own, especially when you have people who are trying to just feed their families? This is a really good question. And I think that the answer to this, because it's one that we struggle with, and I can tell you for the Shosi project, it is something that you know, kept me up at night as I, mean, as I was thinking about coordinating this. And I am sure as I'm sitting here that I got things wrong. I don't see that there's any way that we could have done everything right. I think that the difference is that it really does fundamentally depend on whether or not you treat colleagues on an equal ground. And whether or not those colleagues are coming to you for help and assistance. I can guarantee you this is a project that I would never have taken on if someone had not come to ask me for help. I would not want to be in that, position, that neo-colonial position here. And I think what's striking about that project and what I would hope would be the legacy of that project is to, to know and understand that the organization of it was flat, that our Syrian and Iraqi colleagues were just as empowered to act on the project as I was. And we worked very diligently to try and remove that historic power dynamic. Did we do it perfectly? I'm sure we did it, it, did it imperfectly. But I hope that the record on this project will show that we tried and that others will be able to come along and assess better ways to do it than we did. Other questions? Sir. What was the role of the governments of these countries in these activities? Very good question. So the, um, the Shosi project at one point required 14 different permits from three different governing entities. Governing entities that sometimes didn't get along with each other even inside the same country. I often joke that my job on that project was just to figure out who I was going to make angry at me at any given day. The, in, in Iraq, the situation was very substantively different than Syria. Iraq, the State Board of Antiquities and, and Heritage maintained functioning integrity um, and permitting authority during and throughout the conflict. Syria was a very different story. And one of the things that we made a very self-conscious decision very early on into the conflict was that the lion, the, almost the entire universe of international resources was going to the Assad regime for protecting cultural heritage. And there were lots of questions about that internationally, about what that meant for corruption and what that mean for diversion of resources. 
we made a very self-conscious decision together with officials from the US government that we would work with civil society actors and heritage professionals outside of the control of the Assad regime who were not receiving any kind of international assistance and to focus our attention there. That's one of the reasons why the permitting to that project was so complicated. But that's a decision I have no regrets over. And um, I sleep very well at night knowing that we were able to provide resources to <coughs> people who desperately needed it to do work that they desperately needed to do. This museum also has a amazing collection, and I don't remember which country specifically, I believe it was Greece, was asking for certain objects back, and the British Museum responded saying that they were safeguarding the objects at the time. Are there any similar regulations? Well, there, there are many similar arguments about whether museums in places like Europe or in the United States are safeguarding collections and not returning collections that may have been removed either on a colonial context or under other kinds of dubious legality. I mean, this is an ongoing fight that occurs uh, around archaeological material and material that's as, that is as important as the Parthenon marbles, for instance. What I will say is the Syria conflict functionally changed much of the dialogue about this and the arguments that archaeologists and museums have. I was in the audience in September 2014 at the Metropolitan Museum, which has been one of the organizations frequently criticized by archaeologists for the acquisition of dubious material. And as their then director, Tom Campbell, stood up and said, and on no uncertain terms, that no museum in this country should acquire anything from a conflict country. It was a stronger statement than I'd ever heard any archaeologist make. And that was a real watershed moment because it opened up the space between the archaeological community to have a conversation with the museum community, which it had been feuding with for some time about how to deal with situations like Syria and Iraq. It was something of a detente, and I'm hopeful that the collaborations that ensued can continue. Because the issue became less about acquiring looted material, and it became more about which museums are willing to help and which museums are not, as well as which archaeologists are willing to help and which ones are not. This was a very different kind of framing, a very different development in our field. Yeah. Have you had any involvement with Egypt during or after their uh, civil unrest there? So um, this museum released a list of the objects likely looted from the Cairo Museum in the immediate aftermath of the civil unrest. Um, I also um, worked um, on the archaeological community's response to the civil unrest and ultimately a memorandum of understanding between the government of Egypt and the United States to restrict uh, looted material from Egypt into the United States. And that MOU, I believe, was ultimately signed in 2015. And um, this museum uh, prepared the policy brief for the archaeological community that was used in that particular case. Yeah. Do you find that auction houses in this country and other countries are willing to carefully research with fraudulent for auction in the way of antiquity? I find that the auction houses have a mixed reputation on this. And it depends on the specific auction house. Um, I would single out Sotheby's, actually, as having made the most radical transformation toward transparency um, since 2006. The um, other auction houses, in some ways, are still a bit behind where Christie, uh, sorry, where uh, Sotheby's actually is. Um, and I think that there has been more research. I would not call it perfect research by any stretch of the imagination across the auction houses. What we've started to see in the um, antiquities dealing community is more sales by non-auction houses that have less transparency associated with them or internet sales 
where there's really you know, kind of no, um, no obvious or public sort of nexus where we would know it was actually being sold. And I think that that was a market development in response to the auction houses adopting a position of more, more transparency and more legal scrutiny. Well, thank you very much for coming this evening.